number one multicultural channel. This is Tag TV. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. After one year of Taliban rule, the human rights situation in the country hasn't changed much. Poverty is looming, with terrorism and violence returning to the levels of pre-Taliban 2.0 era. The de facto Taliban government hasn't been able to live up to its peace process promises and is now struggling to secure even grants and assistance from foreign countries and the international community. There is unending misery and suffering for the people of Afghanistan. A year after the Taliban resumed power, people in the war-torn country are not just struggling for their daily bread and butter, but their lives also hang by a thread amidst an increasingly hostile atmosphere. As per the United Nations, some 250 people lost their lives in recent weeks, the highest monthly number of civilian casualties over the last year. Most recently, on August 17th, a bomb ripped through a mosque in capital Kabul during the evening prayers, which killed at least 21 people, including children and a cleric. More than 30 others were seriously injured. Doctors and staff at Emergency Hospital, a facility run by an Italian NGO, rushed to save as many lives as possible with limited resources in hand. But there is only so much that can be done in the crisis-stricken country as the situation becomes worse daily at the hands of the Taliban. It's not my place to comment why and uh, who is responsible for it, but definitely that people and civilians are getting injured and that they are suffering and that they are dying from uh, bullets, shrapnels, uh, it's, uh, it's evident. Islamic State Khorasan province is being seen as the main perpetrator of these horrific attacks that have escalated since the Taliban takeover last year. Past attacks by Islamic State have targeted civilians, places of worship, and Afghan minority groups. Taliban-led Afghanistan has been able to do nothing to stop these attacks from taking place. Gurdwara Karte Parwan, the largest holy place for minority Sikhs in Afghanistan, was attacked twice in two months. In a major attack at the Sikh temple in June, two people lost their lives and many were injured. The attack also prompted panic-stricken Hindus and Sikhs to flee Afghanistan. The Gurdwara was again attacked by a bomb on July 27. The Taliban government, which has yet to gain legitimacy in the eyes of the West and other countries in the world, continues to face economic sanctions causing a massive shortage of essential items such as medicines. Unfortunately, the, begin, the first half of August, um, there were several incidents similar. And um, and our uh, we are worried about the, the availability of beds, as uh, they was say was saying, because this is something that uh, you know um, anytime someone is coming to our gate uh, for us is a patient and uh, is our duty our role to to treat him or her in the best way as possible. The Taliban's capture of Kabul on August 15, 2021 brought the hardline rulers back into power in Afghanistan nearly 20 years after they were toppled by the United States invasion following the 9-11 attacks. The growing conflict of the ruling Taliban with Islamic State Khorasan province and National Resistance Front of Afghanistan continues to keep Afghanistan on the boil. According to the International Crisis Group, Western countries are concerned with Afghanistan becoming a safe haven for dangerous insurgents and terrorist groups, fearing that jihadist groups will launch attacks upon the West. The Taliban's treatment of women has further kept the West away from providing any assistance to the Afghan government. Despite the grim situation, many resilient Afghan citizens still believe that the violence and terrorism is temporary, the good and happy old days are around the corner, and that the country will return to its previous prosperity in times to come. Moving on. It's been five years since the lives of Rohingya refugees were hit by a doom. They are struggling for food, shelter and health care. They are leading a life of misery. Several of them carried out demonstrations in Bangladesh's refugee camps, marking five years of their exodus. 
They said they wanted to live a life of dignity and no more wanted to be labelled refugees. Blaming the government of Myanmar, the refugees said no serious effort was being made by any side to improve their lives. A large number of Rohingya refugees demonstrated in the overpopulated camps of Bangladesh's Cox's Bazar last week to mark five years of their exodus. Hundreds of thousands of them have been leading a life of misery and suffering in these camps for the past five years with little to no hope of returning back to their homes. Several exercises that were initiated in the past to repatriate them couldn't meet the desirable outcomes and Rohingyas lament that their quality of life has been constantly deteriorating. As per different international observers, a brutal military crackdown in Myanmar forced more than 730,000 to flee across the border. The United Nations statement says it was carried out with genocidal intent. Myanmar denies genocide, saying it was waging a legitimate campaign against insurgents who attacked police posts. More than a million Rohingyas are living in squalid camps in southern Bangladesh, comprising the world's largest refugee settlement. They say even if they returned, they didn't enjoy rights at par with the other citizens of the country. All they demand now is justice. <laughs> The crisis has developed into a protracted emergency for Rohingya in Bangladesh. Most of the camps that were set up for incoming Rohingya around Cox's Bazar were built on uneven sandy hills that were rapidly cleared in response to 2017's mass exodus. Since then, these informal settlements have faced the constant threats of flooding and landslides. All shelters are required to be built from bamboo and tops, meaning that concrete and bricks can't be used as added protection against the elements. Many have collapsed leaving residents exposed to the elements. The makeshift or permanent arrangements for a few thousands made by the Bangladesh government haven't received good feedback either. Since December 2020, the Bangladesh government has moved nearly 20,000 Rohingya refugees to Bhashanchar, a remote silt island in the Bay of Bengal. There is a shortage of food, unreliable water resources, lack of schools and healthcare facilities. And the problems are only compounding with the passing of each day. In such a scenario, one can only hope for a better future. However, no one, not any agency, not any government can commit that they can provide a better future to these refugees. Moving on. For years now, China has been trying to assert and expand its influence in the Indian Ocean. Recently, in the aftermath of United States House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, Beijing docked its ship at Hambantota port. Although the two sides described it as a part of a peaceful patrolling process, the observers have rubbished the statement, saying China had clearly used a military ship to intercept and snoop on other countries facilities in the country, especially that of India. A report.
As the U.S.-China battle for supremacy escalated in the past few weeks following Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, China's continued attempts to assert its influence in the Indian Ocean remain unabated. Beijing docked what military experts call a dual-use spy ship, Yuan Wang-5, at Sri Lanka's Hambantota port in the Indian Ocean. The ship was docked at the port from August 16th to August 22nd. The bigger question, however, is why. While some say it was Beijing's response to Washington's recent diplomatic maneuvers in the South China Sea, others call it an attempt to prevent deepening India-Sri Lanka ties, especially in the wake of India's continued multifaceted support to the island nation during its economic and political crisis. While New Delhi raised concerns over the ship's docking, Sri Lanka, which according to the observers finds itself caught between a rock and a hard place, released a statement in consonance with the Chinese stance. The statement said that there were no underpinnings to the recent developments at the port, and the docking of Yuan Wang 5 was merely a part of the regular patrolling exercises. Experts skeptical of both China and Sri Lanka's explanations have asked why an ultra-modern space-tracking ship used to monitor satellite, rocket, and intercontinental ballistic missile launches was used for a patrolling exercise. It's very clearly a spy ship. Sri Lanka knows exactly what it is. Sri Lanka also knows the consequences of what is going to happen. India also knows that if you allow it to happen once, it's going to happen over and over again, and then it might even become a permanent base after that. Clearly, there is more to the situation than what meets the eye. As per media reports, Sri Lanka was initially reluctant to allow the ship to enter its waters, fearing this could impact the island nation's chances of securing monetary support from neighbour India, the other quad member Japan, and other Western countries. However, experts believe that Beijing leveraged its dominance in the beijing colombo bilateral arrangement and Sri Lanka caved to Chinese pressure. Sri Lanka succumbing to China's debt trap diplomacy could also be another factor. China remains a large creditor to Sri Lanka, and the cash-strapped island nation has been instructed by the IMF to begin debt restructuring talks with China in order to secure a bailout for its people who are suffering from crippling shortages of basic necessities. Currently, Sri Lanka is negotiating for a package between 2 to 3 billion USD, and without Beijing's nod, the process might plunge into an indefinite delay. Although Sri Lanka is not in any position to put up any form of resistance to China, its tourism minister, Haran Fernando, who was in India last week, said India has turned out to be a close friend of Sri Lanka, and that India was being kept apprised of the real-time situation in Sri Lanka through top channels. Unlike China, India's support to Sri Lanka continues to flow without any strings attached. Sri Lanka has to be good friends with everyone. And uh, I'm sure India understands it. And we have had a very good diplomatic relationship with India. And our, our foreign minister, our president, is in constant touch with uh, the foreign minister here and with, uh, the foreign minister Modi as well. The recent turn of events has also rung loud alarm bells for the West. Beijing's control over the Hambantota port also means that Beijing, if remaining unchallenged, can gain control and thereby disrupt the Asia-Europe trade route. An already crippled supply chain will go for a toss if any confrontation occurs in the region. Experts say it is also a challenge for the Quad, the security alliance between the US, India, Australia and Japan. While they have been pushing for a free Indo-Pacific, Beijing continues to flex its muscles in the region with frequent naval superiority exercises and show of force by military jets. Experts also say that the main area of focus should still be on the reality on the ground in Sri Lanka. The island nation and its people are still deep in the throes of economic and political crisis, and the priority should be on first helping the Sri Lankan people. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Taiwan proposed this week 19 billion US dollars in defense spending for next year, a double digit increase on 2022 that includes funds for new fighter jets, weeks after China staged large scale military exercises around the island. 
China carried out largest ever war games around the democratically governed island after a visit this month by US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. The trip infuriated Beijing, which saw it as a US attempt to interfere in China's internal affairs. The overall defense budget proposed by President Tsai Ing-wen's cabinet sets a 13.9 year-on increase to a record 19.41 billion US dollars that includes additional money for fighter jets and other equipment as well as a special funds for the defense ministry. The Directorate General of Budget, Accounting and Statistics did not provide a specific breakdown of where money would go. The planned defense spending, which is a record high and must be approved by Parliament, marks the island's sixth consecutive year of growth in defense spending since 2017. The double-digit rise on 2022 marks a sharp increase compared with the island's defense spending growth in recent years. Yearly growth has been below 4% since 2017. Iran's military carried out two days of drone exercises this week, the state media reported. Footage showed various types of drones being launched and dropping munitions on desert targets. The two-day drills were reported by State TV to involve 150 drones and cover Iran's Gulf Coast and most of its territory. The country's air defenses and electronic warfare capabilities were also to be tested against mock enemy drones. The exercises come amid U.S. fears Iran could supply drones to Russia for use in the conflict in Ukraine. The U.S. said earlier this month that Russian officials were being trained in Iran as part of an agreement on the transfer of drones between the two countries and accused Tehran of planning to supply hundreds of unmanned aircraft to Moscow for use in Ukraine. Iran's foreign minister denied the claim last month, including in a phone call with his Ukrainian counterpart. Iran has developed a large domestic arms industry in the face of international sanctions and embargoes that bar it from importing many weapons. Metaverse is the next big revolution in technology which is gaining impetus as a business opportunity in Japan. The Metaverse Exhibition 2022 was recently organized in Japan wherein people enjoyed exploring the virtual reality universe. Using their pictures, people also made their own avatars with the help of video synthesis technology. Shopping too is getting revolutionized using virtual reality. Staff avatar allow users to try out their favorite items and see how they look from different angles. ま、イベントとかをやっていきながら the virtual reality space was developed by a temporary staffing company. It generates new jobs by utilizing people who work in VR space. An avatar who accepts applications, participates on the internal and guides the VR space by speech and action. The metaverse technology is creating new business ideas and jobs which are turning into great business opportunities. A number of companies are developing metaverse technologies that are transforming human lives. This is a virtual reality space in Japan's Osaka city. The town is famous for its architectural wonders like Suten Kaku Tower and Shisan Bashi, which are regular famous sightseeing spots in Japan. Tourists can easily experience life in the town of Osaka through this virtual reality model. A metaverse event named Virtual Market 2022 Summer was held in Osaka and New York, modeled on VR. Inside the town, corporate advertising and stores were on display, allowing visitors to become avatar to move freely around the VR town and shop. 
It also allows them to enjoy live show and game. Daimaru Matsuzakaya Department Stores, a long-established department store in Japan, sells summer gift products. Visitors can pick up the product and see it. As a unique content, visitors can see photos to learn about company's history. あの、this is staff avatar serving customers is a real employee. Staff avatar sells products while communicating with customers. A number of renowned Japanese artists and individual creators participated in the event. The metaverse is creating different business opportunities in different sectors and industries for people around the world. Moving on, a number of followers of the Nobel laureate Mother Teresa congregated in eastern Indian city of Kolkata and observed the 112th birth anniversary. She was canonized by the Roman Catholic Church on September 4, 2016, just 19 years after her death. However, she is still addressed as Mother Teresa as she was known before her canonization by her followers. Global Order of Nuns founded by St. Teresa, missionaries of charity observed the 112th birth anniversary of the Nobel Peace Laureate as nuns and followers offered prayers in India's eastern Kolkata city. St. Teresa was one of the most influential women in the church's 2000 year history, acclaimed for her work amongst the poorest of the poor. Nuns and followers of St. Teresa gathered around her tomb early in the morning as they took part in a mass prayer service and sang songs. This is a celebration of life of a great person and every birthday is a celebration of all of us. The gift of life is something that comes from God, something sacred and holy. And this life is given to us so we can make a gift to others to live for others. Born as Agonese Gonja Bohajihio to Albanian parents in 1910, in what was then part of the Ottoman Empire and is now Macedonia, became an international figure. She was canonized by the Roman Catholic Church on September 4, 2016, just 19 years after her death. However, she is still addressed as Mother Teresa as she was known before her canonization by her followers. We are really happy to be here, a group of uh, eight of our parties from Spain, because uh, we are following the steps of Mother Teresa. We've been in Darjeeling, the call into the call, and then we are here, uh, and it's a really good experience to be here celebrating our mother's birthday. The Albanian-born nun received several national and international awards for social service during her lifetime. They include the Max Sese Award in 1962, the Pope John XXIII Peace Prize in 1971, the John F. Kennedy International Award in 1971, and the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979. Her love for children orphans and leapers propelled her to an iconic status both within India and in the world outside with people flocking to touch her, see her and be blessed by her. She was popularly known as the saint of the gutter for her extraordinary love and dedication to the poor, the homeless and the diseased. Indians consider Mother Teresa as one of the greatest persons to have walked the country. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. Goodbye and take care.
Number one multicultural channel. This is Tag TV.